Greetings and salutations, fellow book readers. This is Mark, and the book I will review today is Robinson Crusoe. Before we continue, this is personalized limited edition of Robinson Crusoe with leather cover designed and made by me. At the end of the video, I will tell you a couple of ways of how you can get one for yourself, if you are interested. Now let's get back to the review. Robinson Crusoe is a novel written by the English writer Daniel Defoe and published in 1719. Defoe wrote previously essays and articles on politics and social issues, but Robinson Crusoe was his first novel. The book was an instant success, and I heard it is the second most translated work after the Bible. It might be true since it has been around for a while, just like Cervantes' Don Quixote, which is claimed to be the second most published book right after the Bible. Anyway, Robinson Crusoe is arguably the first English novel. Its success inspired the thought to write a couple of sequels, and it gave birth to a new genre of fiction called Robinsonate, which basically encompasses any kind of island survival story. The attractiveness of Robinson Crusoe, or any Robinsonate book, is the island lifestyle, which is not easy, but it is simple, and as the world becomes more complex, unconsciously we search for the simplicity of the old days. The book's escapism theme might reflect the false own fantasy and desire for a bit of peace and simplicity in his life which was pretty full and eventful since he was a very active individual involved in politics and commerce and wrote about it extensively and didn't shy away from confrontations and conflicts. What is Robinson Crusoe about? It is the first and ultimate island survival story, one of the greatest adventures ever told. It describes extreme isolation without any choice of breaking it when man can only depend on himself and his creativity. Also, there's a lesson in appreciating what we have, since we never know when we will lose it. Thus, we never see the true state of our condition till it is illustrated to us by its contraries, nor know how to value what we enjoy, but by the want of it. A bit of the plot. Robinson Crusoe is told as an autobiographical narration. By today's standards, it could be even considered a travel log. Robinson, following his curiosity and against the wishes of his father, decides to explore the world. During his first journey, the ship he is on is sunk in the storm, but this doesn't discourage him, and as soon as he can, he sails again, and manages to be enslaved by the North African pirates. After a while, Crusoe escapes and ends up in Brazil, where he becomes a tobacco grower. A few years later, with encouragement from other plantation owners, he organizes a slave buying trip to West Africa. But on the way there, his ship is destroyed in the storm and he's the only survivor. Well, not counting the dog and a couple of cats. He also is lucky to carry off some weapons, tools and supplies from the ship before the wreck is submerged by the waves. And that's how his stay on the uninhabited tropical island begins. Crusoe spends there almost three decades and keeps himself occupied by exploring the island, hunting, uh, planting, building the shelter, and in spare moments reflecting on his life. Later there also appear cannibals, Spanish castaways, and English mutineers. Uh, eventually Crusoe succeeds in getting off the island and goes back to England. He has a few more adventures while trying to recover his patrimony in Europe and Brazil, and he also revisits the island. And that's the basic plot. What are my thoughts about Robinson Crusoe? I have read it a few times since my childhood, and every time the story seems a bit different, more complex spiritually and psychologically. Probably because each book or reading reflects a bit of the reader himself, 
and each interpretation depends on whom and where in his life the reader is at the time of the reading. The story of Robinson Crusoe and his appeal are timeless because of the consequences of being stranded on the uninhabited island has not changed much since the time the foe was alive. Actually, they have not changed since the time men started to sail the seas. Just watch Castaway with Tom Hanks. He was stranded on the island in the modern times, a few hundred years after Crusoe, but his circumstances were more dire. I think, in general, the men have always wondered, and probably will always wonder, what it would be like to be totally cut off from the civilization and other human beings. In the future, it might not be a deserted island, but an uninhabited planet, and the questions will remain the same. How to maintain oneself alive physically and psychologically? Robinson Crusoe was originally thought to be a first-hand account relayed by the book's protagonist, but later it was confirmed to be a fictitious story. It was also thought the novel was based on the real adventures of Alexander Selkirk, who was rescued from an uninhabited island in the Pacific and his story published a few years before the fall road Robinson Crusoe. Probably partly it is true, but there are many differences between the two adventures I think the foe was inspired by many stories of the island survival circulating during his time. It was the age of discovery and piracy, and the ship was the preferred mode of travel and transportation, and there were countless shipwrecks and many survivors who told their tales. So I would say there was plenty of original material for literal inspiration. For the most readers, Robinson Crusoe is a story of adventures, struggle of one man alone against the nature, simple life occupied with providing basic necessities and overcoming challenges, principally through his own ingenuity and fortitude. It is never too late to be wise. Of course, he has some help from what he considers the higher power, when he finds the wreck of the ship, which stays afloat just long enough for him to gather all the tools and supplies to make his marooning much easier and more pleasant, and the finds allow him to maintain some dignity and the illusion of a civilized man and to behave as a good Christian. He survives on the island by learning through observing and experimenting and taking risks. And now I saw, though too late, the folly of beginning a work before we count the cost and before we judge rightly of our own strength to go through with it. Most importantly, by keeping himself occupied, Crusoe maintains his sanity and general will to live. And this links to Robinson Crusoe, besides being an adventure tale, it being a journey of inner growth and transformation, and the reflection on the fluidity of personal relationship each one has with faith and God. It is a journey from anger and feeling of injustice to resignation caused by our powerlessness, and then acceptance of what seems out of our control, and finally attaining emotional and spiritual peace by seeing the positive in our experience, which is probably brought by our psychological need, instinct of survival, to continue our existence. From this moment, I began to conclude in my mind that it was possible for me to be more happy in this forsaken, solitary condition than it was possible I should ever have been in any other particular state in the world. And with this thought, I was going to give thanks to God for bringing me to this place. And further he continues, I learned to look more upon the bright side of my condition and less upon the dark side, and to consider what I enjoyed 
rather than what I wanted. And this gave me sometimes such secret comforts that I cannot express here. And this spiritual or psychological journey is something many of us can identify with. The symbolism and interpretations of it seem to be decisive to our view and place in the world. The finding of the footprint on the beach has an altering effect on Crusoe's life. The footprint in itself is nothing more than a sign of somebody being there, yet its psychological interpretation has profound impact on Crusoe's behavior. What does it mean? There is the life before it, when he settles into his island life and accepts its finality, and the life after it, with the possibility of reconnecting with other humans. There is the sensation of danger, but also hope for rescue. The book has a bit of biblical foundation, which was not unusual for the times it was written in, and it shows the power of faith and belief over individuals. Crusoe commits an original sin of disobedience, like Adam who went against the order from God not to touch the forbidden fruit, he goes against his father's advice and wishes and goes out to sea. However, he afterwards talked very gravely to me, exhorted me to go back to my father and not tempt providence to my ruin, told me I might see a visible hand of heaven against me, and young man, said he, depend upon it, if you do not go back, wherever you go, you will meet with nothing but disasters and disappointments till your father's words are fullified upon you. So Crusoe's island can be seen as an earthly purgatory where he is condemned to reflect on the mistakes he committed, purify himself of his vices and approximate himself to God through reading the Bible, which incidentally was the only book he found inside the wrecked ship. After Crusoe accepts his situation or punishment and repents, even symbolically pays for his sins, the island transforms itself for Crusoe into a type of Garden of Eden, where he becomes contented with the idea of spending the rest of his life there. And further, just like in Eden, Crusoe is provided with the basic needs but lacks human companionship. So he prays unconsciously through his dreams and later visualizes his symbolic Eve and his prayers are answered when Friday appears. And then appears the symbolic snake in the form of the English ship which takes him out of his Eden to where he occasionally yearns to return. The novel also has intellectual, political, social and economic context relating to its times. Crusoe is a symbol of the English advancement sped through social relationships, such as with the foreign captains, growing global commercial links as shown in the exploitation of his plantation in Brazil, political expansion when he discovers and surveys the island and claims it as his own, and continues the claim to its ownership even after leaving it. And further, there is the demonstration of the intellectual superiority of the Europeans by Crusoe being able to adapt and survive in such an alien environment. Also by seeing the slaves and natives as his inferiors. The book encapsulates the early Anglo-Saxon or even European colonial spirit, so Robinson's Island might be seen as a bit of microcosm of the British colonization, similar to the immigrant colonization of North America, where there was an abundance of seemingly unused land since North American natives were hunters-gatherers who did not find individual land ownership practical. Contrary to the English, who preferred farming and more sedentary lifestyle based on land ownership, so the English claimed seemingly uninhabited 
or rather unclaimed the land for themselves and protected it from the occasional visits by the natives. Friday is a symbol of the new world, or should I say the outer world, since the European view or interpretation of it could be applied to anywhere outside of Europe. There is a certain fear of it, but the fear is outdone by curiosity and more so the desire for material wealth, which led to the need of controlling the native population. Europeans saw the natives as inferior and spiritually lost, so they concluded the savages needed practical guidance and religious salvation. And this was the moral reason or excuse for the European colonization. Based on this, I can partly see how the book can be understood by the non-Europeans and how they can interpret it. There is the implication of European superiority where the white man can go anywhere and with limited resources can create or recreate something resembling civilization, a civilization as defined by the Europeans. So the indirect message of Robinson Crusoe basically is that the white man was put on earth to dominate and save the world. To sum it up, Robinson Crusoe is a bit of an escape to a place where life is simpler, decisions to make are obvious, and consequences more predictable. The simplicity is worrying about the basics such as food and shelter. The decision is what foods to gather and plant to vary your diet, so you will not face the consequence of living exclusively of coconuts and fish. Actually, Crusoe never resorted to gathering coconuts and fishing because he made the right decisions. But under the surface, the book is a lot more complex than its apparently simple plot. The book is a study of individualism, where the individual is in the center and society's presence is relative, because physical survival is paramount. Further, Crusoe is driven by rationality with occasional emotion, and it is a reflection of the Defoe's own life in the early stages of the Age of Enlightenment and emergence of the power of the individual, where for the first time in history one could move up the social ladder relatively fast, depending only on his own hard work, innovation, and the ability to take risk. We could call it the beginning of the American dream before America existed. I am referring to America the country and not the continent. This is also the beginning of the large-scale immigration and settling of the distant lands. So Crusoe is a symbol of the individual in the age of exploration and European conquest and the moral value of his actions is relative and depends on where you are looking at them from. Looking at it today, knowing the consequences of imperialism, colonialism and slave trade makes it easy to be critical. But at the time of the novel's inception, many actions of Crusoe were seen as positive and just. In the course of our lives, the evil which in itself we seek most to shun, and which, when we are fallen into, is the most dreadful to us, is oftentimes the very means or door of our deliverance, by which alone we can be raised again from the affliction we are fallen into. I think some more progressive readers will have a problem with Robinson Crusoe's social and political perspective, but Robinson Crusoe is more than anything a book and a man as a reflection of its times, and that's how it should be looked at. Yes, he had slaves called native savages and drowned in mass baby cats, but in a couple of centuries others might read what the progressives and what of our times wrote and done and be discussed by the hypocrisy of, on one hand, preaching the need to 
to save the planet, but on the other, contributing to its destruction by engaging in unnecessary consumption, polluting through pointless and aimless travel, and ignoring issues such as overpopulation, because the criticism of it would be directed at the demographics they consider victims. So perhaps we should be a bit more understanding with the people who didn't have the benefit of our hindsight. Anyway, Robinson Crusoe is a great example of early novel and a great survival story, which has inspired many other works and have been interpreted in a variety of styles and forms. There are many film adaptations that can add a bit of visual reference to the reading, I personally liked the 2003 French film simply titled Robinson Crusoe. Perhaps there was a bit too much French progressive liberalism injected into the script, but overall the film was pretty good. Okay, let's talk about the physical book. The book I am holding is a paperback, which I transformed into a hardcover leather-bound edition. To make the cover, I use grade A, naturally tanned hide, I buy from Tenere in North Spain. It is the same leather Louis Vuitton uses to make his bag, so it is top quality. I do all the processing of the leather myself. First, I design the cover, which what I did here, I used a painting of Robinson Crusoe with the inseparable umbrella to protect him from the tropical sun fully clothed, including a goatskin hat, probably suffering from the heat in order to keep his civilized dignity. He seems to be pretty settled on his island, but still looking at the horizon, wondering or hoping if he will ever see sails again. Uh, this is the back with the blurb, and inside front cover I printed a quote from the book. If you want to see a more detailed video where I explain how I transform paperback into leather-bound hardcover, click on the link in the description. I will make a maximum of 100 editions of each title. Each one will be numbered and initialed, and the numbers will go in chronological order from two up, since number one stays with me. The price will be around $100, so if you would like me to make one for you, you can click below on my email and send me a message. I do not guarantee I will do it since it will depend on the time I have available, access to leather, and if I can get my hands on the copy of the book. Now, if you're not willing to spend the hundred dollars, but you still want the book, what you can do is click below on the PayPal link and donate three dollars or more to my channel. And for every 100 donations, I will make a lottery and draw one name and the winner will receive the book. So, if you are cheap but feel lucky, this might be the way to do it. Also, your donations give me the extra motivation to make the book reviews, and I appreciate them very much, so thank you in advance. One more thing, when you make your donation, remember to include the title of the book you would like to win. The book itself is beautiful. Visually, it has a very nice texture, it smells great, and the more you handle it, the more beautiful it will become. And it makes a great gift for yourself or somebody who appreciates books. So if you want one, don't snooze or you might lose. Well, that's it. So let's end it here. And until next time, keep your ear close to the ground and read a book. Adios.